and it has real consequences. And the next point is signing up for Medicaid expansion will save New Hampshire money. Again, the Lewin Group and others have come out with research that suggests that's absolutely not true. If we didn't accept the program, we'd save 66 to $114 million just between 2014 and 2020. The third point, I think this is a big one, Medicaid improves health outcomes. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest this. A New England Journal of Medicine uh, study of 12,000 adults shows that you actually get no additional health benefits if you have Medicaid versus having no insurance at all. So this doesn't improve the health of anyone. And another related argument is, well, we'll cut down on unnecessary emergency room care. Well, the problem is if people sign up for Medicaid, it doesn't necessarily change how they use emergency rooms. They may be signed up for Medicaid, but they still go to the emergency rooms anyway. You don't get any actual savings as a result. So then we moved on. So the House has passed this plan. They passed it in the special session. It was rejected. They passed a worse plan this time around. And in essence, what we said is we're going to take the federal money, we're going to spend the federal money, and we're not going to have any oversight on how that money is spent. And the money will be spent centrally by the government in the state of New Hampshire. So that's, that's the House plan. Uh, Senate leadership came up with a different plan. They said, well, we want a market-based plan. They've tried to pivot and say, well, it's not Obamacare, even though they're taking the $2.4 billion under Obamacare. They're calling it a market-based solution, where we take the money from the federal government, put it in a trust fund, and then pay it out to, I don't know, one, maybe two or three insurers. That is the definition of crony capitalism. When we talk about this in very serious terms, you have crony capitalism, that that's not a free market solution, that isn't any different. You're taking money through taxation and you're directing it to a specific group. The person that they hired to consult on this plan uh, is the gentleman that was responsible for drafting Medicare Part D under the George W. Bush administration. He was found guilty by CRS of lying to Congress about the costs. And this is a trillion dollar disaster. So this is who we've been consulting with, even on the Republican side. The other point is that, well, the Republican Senate plan uses private health insurance and it won't expand the Medicaid rolls. Well, that's not true. There's a transition period. Even if you could get the exchanges set up and you take the federal money, put it into a trust fund, and then throw it over through this crony capitalist system into a couple of different insurers, you still have a period of time where you're going to be juicing up the Medicaid rules. And I'm sure we all can guess how Medicaid is going to be eager to transition people off of those roles. And lastly, we can count on the federal government to fund the $2.4 billion uh, commitment. We've had this situation at a state level with education. Uh, we have a situation where the federal government said, we'll reimburse you for special education, 40 cents on the dollar. They ended up coming back at 17 cents on the dollar. Paul Ryan and other fiscally conservative Republicans in the House have already said out of the gates, they don't want to reimburse at 100% for three years. They want to move to 50% as quickly as possible. So this is a horrible situation. And we've already seen the outcomes of this. Where is Obamacare right? Right now, only 2.5 million or so people have signed up, and 79% of those people that have signed up are eligible for subsidies. And then, out of, do you look at the, beyond that, 6.5 million people who have signed up have signed up for Medicaid, which is 100% subsidized by the taxpayers. So if you look at this total pool, you have 9 million people, only 500,000 are actually putting any money into the system. Well, how's it working in New Hampshire? Well, we have a situation right now where uh, they've actually, uh, I'll actually move to the next slide, they're actually changing the demographics. Initially this was, you need 18 to uh, 25 year olds, you need to get 40% of that group to sign up in order to cover everybody else. So the idea is you get these young people that don't have health insurance claims to put all this money in and that's how we're going to pay for this whole thing. And in order for that to work, you needed 40% of the 18 to 25 year olds. Well, they looked at the enrollment figures, they changed that, they said, well, no, we'll go from 18 to 25 to 18 to 34. Well, how's that working? 22% of 18 to 34-year-olds are signing. This program is fundamentally insolvent. We've seen it at the national level, we've seen it in New Hampshire. 
So the issue is, why are the Republicans in the state Senate pursuing this, other than, again, Senator Sanborn, who frankly stood alone during the special session. We'd already have this had, uh, had Andy not actually stood up and actually pushed back on this, because there was uh, the movement to get this done. The reason ultimately, because I've met with you know, Chuck Morris, Jeb Bradley, I've met with all these folks. At the end of the day, the Democrats are controlling the message and they're framing the debate. In essence, we've lost how we even look at the role of government with respect to many facets of our life, education, healthcare, and other ones. And in essence, we've already bought off on the fact that, well, there's a healthcare crisis and only the government can solve it, which is false. But we bought that to the point where we now say, if somebody says, well, if you don't do something about it as the Republican Party, then you're not compassionate. You don't care. You're the party of no. And frankly, I think we need to kind of rebrand ourselves as the party of no, K-N-O-W. And I look at this in an interesting way. I mean, we know that, we're the, that freedom and capitalism have led to the highest standard of living in human history. And this maybe sounds obvious to most of the people in this room, but it's struck me. I've talked to a lot of people that are even active in the Republican Party that are between 20 and 30, and you ask them, well, where were you when the Berlin Wall fell? The Berlin Wall fell? And they're like, I don't know, it was two, three, five? What was all that about? I can't wait to see what the common core standards are on social <laughs> studies when it comes to Cold War. We're teaching more about social justice than we are about what happened during the Cold War. And it's personal for me because my wife immigrated here in 1987, their family had to bribe the KGB to come to the United States. My father-in-law is a scientist, uh, he's a mechanical engineer, uh, brilliant enough in the Soviet Union where, even though everybody has the same wage, he was the only guy that could fix things, so we ended up having multiple jobs. But at the end of the day, he had to bribe his way out of the KGB. And when he came to the United States, he refused welfare. And despite the fact that he was this scientist, he took a job working at a gas station. Didn't know English, learned English, got an entry-level job at Boston Scientific, and 17 years later has 15 patents under his name and is a, is a senior fellow, brought his other family members there, paid for them to come in. And so when my wife and I bought our first house in Bedford, we're, it's Labor Day, I think, 2010, we're painting our family room, and Obama's on the TV in the background, and it, it's, he's speaking in front of a labor group. And at this point, his English is pretty good. And he says, you know what? I've heard those words before. What he's saying is exactly what we used to hear in the Soviet Union. So with this, in the, within the span of one generation, people have escaped communism, come to a place where people don't even, even know what the, what the Cold War is all about, don't remember the Berlin Wall, and we're having to learn all of these lessons over and over again. We know the data and the facts are on our side. I already talked about Medicaid. You can look at government involvement in health care. We have to start talking about and re-educating people on what happens when you have a compassionate society that takes care of people. Like, for instance, in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union decided, we want to take care of everyone's food needs. So in 1932, they decided to collectivize all of the farms. Led to the Soviet famine of 1932, 1933. Six million people died as a result of this activity. Do you remember the bread lines? In the United States? No, you don't. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of our voters who weren't even born when we had a situation where we had a Cold War where the other side was standing in bread lines, my wife's family in that group, this actually happened. But do people now understand that? Look at it again, Havana. You know, pre-communism, post-communism. Look at Hong Kong. You have, you know, pre-communism and then capitalism. And I have this, I haven't integrated it yet. There's a great, I don't know if anyone has watched the show Top Gear, but they test all kinds of interesting cars. They have a great segment where they take cars from Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, even when Great Britain nationalized their auto industry, you know, they compared the cars, what, you know, our Ford, you know, our Ford model at the time, comparable price. So they take an Eastern Bloc car, they take a British car, uh, they and they, you know, they kind of do a comparison. I mean, literally at one point they show this Russian car where it doesn't drive, it doesn't have power steering, but they've thought enough where 
there's a hole at the bottom cut out so that you can go ice fishing. <laughs> so, so, so at the end of the day, that's, that's what communism's brought. But you know, actually you talk about Soviet Union, let's go closer to home. This is Greece. People would say, well, I can't go on full retirement at age 55. Well, let's get out the Molotov cocktails. So we really need to brand this. And it's not just about statistics. We really need, we need to reintroduce these concepts in a way that tells a story. The other point is, we're the party of no in the sense that we know that you can't be both compassionate and insolvent at the same time. And this is the thing that just gets me time and time again. So, well, you care for people, well, you have $17 trillion in debt. How exactly are you going to care for people? I, I actually, I've got to figure out how to integrate this live into the slide, because I started doing these one month after the other, and you know, you look at the national debt and growth, it's just, it's actually, I actually did one that was spaced out one year, I'm like, okay, a $1.5 trillion difference, but people have become completely oblivious to these kinds of statistics. We need to describe what collectivism, communism, and socialism, what the results of that are. Because people just simply don't know. And lastly, we know that our national and state constitutions were written, were written to limit our government and protect our rights. And this is uh, very much at the heart of the live free or die motto. Um, you know, I have one small example of, as it relates to Obamacare, another unintended consequence. Because we think about well, whether everybody's covered or not, but we don't think about the impact of government regulation on progress and innovation. I mean, are many of you familiar with the company 23andMe? So you've heard this. This is a company that was, that was started by uh, the wife of one of the co-founders of Google. And the idea was, or is, or maybe was, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, they sit, for $99, you send away for a kit, you have a saliva sample, your genetic structure is analyzed, and it tells you your propensity for a couple of hundred different diseases, what your drug interactions are likely to be, so on and so forth. It's not paid for by insurance. Um, and they give you some really interesting results. We don't know a lot about the genetic code. Uh, we're still trying to figure this out, but this is an interesting way to figure this out. I mean, you can actually have a whole bunch of people who say, well, I've got this gene, you know, I've got this gene, we don't know what they do, but you know, you happen to be pitching in the World Series and you're both left-handed, maybe that gene means something, right? There's a lot of information you can learn through this approach. This particular individual, this is a, a screenshot of uh, something that did exist. The FDA has now banned this, but what you would get is output. It would tell you, well, here's your propensity of getting Parkinson's disease or type 2 diabetes. Uh, here are your drug responses to these various different things. And after Obamacare was passed, maybe it's just a fluke, the FDA came out and said the, the agency orders 23andMe to stop marketing its test immediately, warning erroneous results could cause customers to seek unnecessary and ineffective medical care. So in other words, you can't have data or information about yourself. You can't collaborate voluntarily with others to learn about your health because you know what? There might be unnecessary costs. And this is the most difficult thing to talk about when you talk about capitalism and unintended consequences because how many other companies are there like that that never got started? or faced a billion dollars of regulatory costs and couldn't possibly get their drug to market. So how do we stop Obamacare expansion now? So again, we have little details about this new compromise that was announced today. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go with being optimistic that we have enough time. Andy Shaken said, I, I'll go with optimistic that if we, work hard enough, we can actually stop this. Uh, and the RLCNH put together a pledge. Pledges, I hereby pledge that I'll not support the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, in any form, including but not limited to, expanding Medicaid in New Hampshire through the use of federal funds, regardless of how those funds are allocated. Well, there's good news. And when we talk about almost every candidate, Republican candidate for federal office, including uh, both of the individuals here tonight have signed this pledge, which is good news for us and bad news for Andy Custer, regardless of where you are on the spectrum. We, we clearly have a, a great approach on that. Uh, our, uh, our, our only declared candidate for governor, Andrew Hemingway, has signed this pledge. And every member of the House that I've talked to so far 
has also signed the pledge. But at the end of the day, in order to stop this, all we have to do to stop this is to take that pledge and to get 12 state senators to sign the pledge. Uh, that would ultimately result in gridlock, and we could put this thing to bed. The only two senators so far that have signed it are our very own Senator Sanborn and John Reagan. So we need to get 10 more state senators to sign off on this, and then we can put this to bed. So I don't want to spend too much more time on this but other than to say, uh, if you go to our website, uh, rlcnh.org or also stopnhincometax.org, you can get all kinds of information about the pledge. You can sign the pledge yourself. Uh, I encourage you to write op-eds. This is going to be a, a really serious issue. I, I actually, I remember when this happened during the special session, I ended up talking to Nancy Stiles. And, and she said, well, I got a lot of testimonials. A lot of people showed up, whether it was in person or I got these written testimonials saying, I'm for Medicaid expansion. Where are your people? And, you know, and I was there. I, I was at the House hearing. I couldn't even get into the Senate hearing. And there were 40 speakers on the other side. They all came in. They were wearing blue stickers, stop, or, you know, pro-Medicaid. I don't remember exactly what the language was. And I did research on this, and I found out that these were people that were bussed in from a drug rehab facility that's funded by the HHS. So I told Nancy, I said, you know where our people were? They were working to pay for themselves and for everybody else to show up and give you this testimony. Now, at the end of the day, we still need to show up, and we need to do a better job of organizing and doing a, a show of force. So, I would say op-eds, showing up at the public hearings, uh, and if you, know, if you want to talk to me or Matt or George and give us your contact information, we really, this time, this is going to be a real serious issue. They fast-tracked this. I don't know what the motivations are, but we're going to have to really come out uh, in full force. And then lastly, you can run for office. And it's a little early to talk about this in general, but there is a division even within the Republican Party, and I, I think that most of the delegates and a lot of the people are are pretty clear on, on particularly this issue, but there are some, um, you know, in senior leadership that actually disagree. And the only way we can change that is by getting delegates elected. There are over 950 delegate slots available. We only have 485 or something like that delegates. People don't even know they can run. They just don't even know. And, and so it's not a huge obligation. You show up for a meeting once a year, but you get to pick some pretty important things like the platform of the party and, and who's in leadership. And I think that this is an opportunity for, for us to change that. And then we need to coordinate our, our activist groups uh, so that we can at least put up some sort of, a, not only an opposition, but really get the word out uh, and defend our, our state sovereignty and freedom. So with that, I appreciate the time.